For those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Dave Nisi. I've had the honor to serve as your conference chair. If you haven't heard me, you probably haven't been too much. So welcome to the closing plenary. Um, I've got to point out uh, the process that goes on during all of these uh, meetings and plenaries and all of that. I started out with very typed, very neat, very in order notes. This is what I'm doing now. I have numbers, and so as I get lost, please bear with me. Um, I must announce that audio recordings of sessions, plenaries, the whole process are available for sale. They are out near the volunteer desk. The best price you're gonna get is on site. So if there's anything that you really wanna hear again, please go get those. I've also been told to announce, do your evaluations. You do those in your conference app, please make sure you complete those. The evaluations are part of the whole CEU process and trust me, they read every single one of them. It does change the content of what we do. Lastly, clinic tours, if you are on a one o'clock clinic tour, as soon as we close, go immediately not to the volunteer desk, go to the main registration desk. Buses are gonna leave immediately from there. If you have not had a chance to sign up but would like to go on a tour, please do go to the volunteer desk. There are some slots available. We can squeeze into some buses. We can get you on some clinic tours. So that covers the business. Um, I do want to sum up a few things from our conference. We have had about 1,700 of you here this week. Uh, we have had 70 exhibits and over 260 exhibitors here at the conference. So it's been a wonderful, excellent turnout. Yes, please. So to sum up, I, now I'm thrown off. They make me look at the clock and it's not ticking down. So I have an infinite period of time. Um, no, I won't. Um, to sum up, Monday in our opening plenary, we heard about the state of Florida with Uta Gaziak. And Dr. Trevison spoke with us about CSAT initiatives, things going on nationally. We had a wonderful presentation by Senator Scott with encouraging words about Congress being highly in support of what we do and confirming many of our, whoa, went down to five minutes and 30 seconds, okay. And confirming that Congress is doing nothing, his words, not mine. Uh, so the opening plenary was a great beginning. Tuesday, we had what was unique at this conference. It was wonderful, uh, plenary focused entirely on corrections. We heard from Dr. Gibson about national corrections movements. We also had Judge Cohen presenting to us on what the drug courts are doing and shifting to partnering with us. We had truly a moving message from Sheriff Lima about corrections and how they are partnering with us in this battle. So as the song goes, the times they are a change in, it's now, take the reins. Today, we are gonna hear from Miss Donetta Spears, and I have a Donetta and a Danita just to complicate things. She will be addressing policy issues for DEA, and she's got some great stuff to tell you about. We also have General McCaffrey with his vast ONDC peer experience to fill us in on some critical policy initiatives that are going on. So this is going to be an excellent closing plenary. So my thoughts to close for my part. As a reminder, for those of you on the front lines working with our patients, our unique, resilient, wonderful patients, please remember two things. You must always practice honesty and grace. But you have to practice them together because you see grace without honesty is a cheerleader with no team. But honesty without grace is surgery with no anesthesia. Both are very valuable, but not by themselves. 
So as we go forth, I hope you have been inspired, enlightened, excited. I hope you've had a good time, a, a magical experience, as they say. And I would ask when you go back to your patients, please be sure that you are practicing grace and honesty in doing the miraculous Herculean jobs that all of you do on the front lines fighting this battle. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker this morning. Ms. Donetta Spears, Donetta, is the Deputy Assistant Administrator from DEA. She will address, be addressing policy issues that impact OTPs, as well as sharing with us trends that they are seeing and are being made around the country among the OTPs. Please join me in welcoming her. I'm already going to warn you, they told me what I'm supposed to press up here, but it might not work out that way. But just bear with me. So good morning. On behalf of the 9,000 men and women of the Drug Enforcement Administration and Acting Administrator Utam Dillon, I want to express my sincere thanks for the opportunity to speak directly with you, our treatment providers nationwide. You are on the front lines, day in and day out. And at no time in our history has your work been this important. I also want to thank General McCaffrey for being here today and to recognize his outstanding leadership in the areas of addiction treatment, effective law enforcement, drug prevention, education, and outreach. Again, I introduce myself. My name is Donetta Spears, and I run DEA's Office of Diversion Control Regulatory. In this capacity, I oversee the day-to-day -day operations of over 700 diversion investigators nationwide whose job is to ensure compliance with the Controlled Substances Act. I am also a diversion investigator, 30 years, actually who has worked in the field with the treatment providers, ensuring their compliance with our regulations. I want to spend my time here today addressing head on one of our priorities, and that is to talk directly to prescribers about the fear of DEA, and how this fear has led to a stigma that DEA doesn't support treatment. I am here today to tell you that we fully support treatment. And today, more than ever, we need to partner with the treatment community to solve this epidemic. I'll start by sharing some statistics about who we regulate. Then we'll dive into some numbers about the size of the treatment community across the nation, and then highlight the number of treatment providers that are subjected to administrative sanctions by DEA. Contrary to popular belief, DEA is not kicking down doors, raiding offices, or shutting down legitimate drug treatment practices. I think this is vitally important in our order to mobilize the, mo the prescriber community nationwide and increase drug treatment across the United States. I will end with updates of our regulatory efforts. See, I already forgot, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Compliance with DEA regulations is predicated on the concept of registration. Every person or entity who wishes to manufacture, distribute, dispense, or administer a controlled substance must obtain a registration. And this way, there is a closed system of drug distribution. Diversion grants registrants, registrations based on the activity that the individual wishes to perform. The different registrant classes are listed in the table. A registrant's reporting and record keeping requirements are based on the type of registration they obtain. 
Of our more than 1.8 million registrants, 94% are prescribers. Failure to comply with DEA regulations can result in a range of actions from letters of admonition to the revocation of a registration. In addition, violations of the CSA, Controlled Substance Act, can lead to civil and or criminal actions. Uh-oh, what did I do? There, oops. That's not, okay, wait a minute. See, I told you, patience. Hold on. I, I think that, here we go. I don't think that's it. Yes, now we're here. I apologize, I told you that in advance. Sorry about that. As of last week, this is the current size of our nation's treatment community. We have more than 69,000 data wave practitioners here in the United States, which represents 4% of our prescriber community. In addition, we have an additional 1,750 opioid treatment programs. Now this number changes daily. So before I left on Monday evening from the office, I ran the numbers again, and the numbers have increased. We have 70,120 data wave practitioners right now registered. This is some really good news here. Despite the relatively small percentage of prescribers who are data wave, this number is actually 71% higher than where we were in October of 2017. At that time, we had 40,641 data wave practitioners. Also, we have seen an 11% increase in the number of OTPs. Back in 2017, we had 1,578. Now we're up to 1,753. These increases can be attributed to efforts by HHS to increase patient limits by qualifying practitioners, as well as efforts by Congress to improve access through passage of the Support Act one year ago. Last year on October 14, 2018, DEA was invited to participate in a listening session attended by several federal agencies, including the ONDCP Director, the HHS Assistant Secretary for Health, the Surgeon General, and the head of SAMHSA. In attendance were also approximately 15 associations representing the prescriber community, including, were the, including in attendance were the AMA, the ASAM, the ACEP, and others. Beyond the issues of reimbursement, which were squarely directed at HHS, not DEA, a persistent thing was the fear of DEA. That meeting was important to us, and in the subsequent months, we partnered with Dr. McCants Katz to confront this issue with data. We were happy to learn that she included that in her call to action this past April. Quote, this is what she said. The data tells us that there is nothing to fear for the vast majority of practitioners. Of the over 1.68 million DEA registered prescribers, only 77 total had any administrative actions taken on them. One of the other things we did immediately after that was work with the AMA Alliance on a short video that I'd like to show you now. The Drug Enforcement Administration has a regulatory responsibility in overseeing the nearly 1.8 million registrants who prescribe and dispense controlled substances. To support these healthcare communities, the DEA has developed education and prevention programs to engage and educate healthcare professionals in the fight against the opioid epidemic, such as the Practitioner Diversion Awareness Conference here in Nashville. 
For the medical professionals attending this conference, the overall message from the DEA is clear. We need them as partners. And they need more doctors to treat opioid addiction, and that includes what's called data-waved practitioners. Now what that means is they're a practitioner and subsequent they can treat addicted patients with buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is a Schedule Three drug. Uh, they usually call it Suboxone, or you can you hear people say uh, reference these doctors. They're Suboxone doctors, buprenorphine doctors, uh, but we call them a data wave physician, and they can see up to a certain amount of patients each month. The DEA supports the increased availability of buprenorphine for medically assisted treatment, and data-waved physicians and practitioners can treat patients with opioid use disorder in their offices. The problem is, is that a very, very small percent of our practitioners have actually gotten the certification, and even a smaller amount are actually using it. There are approximately 1.68 million practitioners eligible to become data waived in order to prescribe and dispense buprenorphine. But only about 3% of these practitioners are registered to do so. And the DEA supports expanded treatment efforts to stem the opioid epidemic. So we want to get those numbers up. To do that, they have to clear up another misperception that the DEA singles out data waived practitioners for investigation. We look at a very small percentage of the doctors, and, and that is people who are egregious in the way that they're doing things. The DEA does emphasize good record keeping and is looking at ways to decrease the paperwork. And here's where it comes back to the partnership. Yeah, yeah, because we need them to be able to have this treatment available. And so we want to work with them so that they know what records they have to keep and what rules to follow. But we want to do that. We want to open up this, this arena. While the DEA's mission is primarily enforcement, they favor and promote treatment options, which include the prescribing of buprenorphine. Their message to doctors, don't be afraid to become data waived and treat opioid misuse. In Nashville, I'm Craig Boswell. Okay, I'm struggling. Do I just press the button and it should come up? Oh, I'm up there. Okay, not on the small. Okay, sorry. Thank you. So let's dig into the numbers a little bit, as you see on the screen. I don't see it. Now I see it. Thank you. DEA utilizes a range of administrative actions to ensure compliance with the Controlled Substances Act ranging from letters of admonition, memorandums of agreement, to license revocation. These stats have been of tremendous interest to Congress and the media during the height of the opioid epidemic. And whereas Congress has expressed concerns that we aren't using these tools enough, we now know that these actions have created fear of DEA, and by extension, a stigma that DEA doesn't support treatment. First of all, with over 1.8 million registrants, we revoke between 900 and 1,000 registrations per year. And as this was mentioned in the video, that is one half of 1% of the DEA registrants in the country. Here's the point. The overwhelming majority of DEA registrants follow the law, and therefore have nothing to fear. But a very small percentage, less than one half of 1%, exploit human frailty for profit. These individuals have had a disproportionate effect on the epidemic. We will continue to target them, while at the same time supporting you. The two are not mutually exclusive. We are judicious in the manner in which we use our order to show cause and immediate suspension order authority. Over the last 24 months, DEA has used these authorities on 191 occasions. 
23 of those actions were against either a data wave practitioner or an opioid treatment program. That represents on average 0.17% of the treatment community. Likewise, when we look at the number of surrenders that DEA has obtained, over the last 24 months, DEA has secured 1,612 surrenders, 244 of which were against a, either a data wave practitioner or an opioid treatment program. That represents on average 0.2% of our treatment committee. The vast and overwhelming majority of you have nothing to fear. DEA supports you. We have all seen the mortality statistics from the CDC as they represent the matrix by which all of us, including DEA, are being evaluated. As you know, drug poisoning continues to be the leading cause of injury death in the United States and has outpaced deaths by motor vehicle crashes, firearms, homicides, suicide, every year since 2009. In 2017, over 70,000 people died from drug poisoning, which equates to approximately 192 deaths per day. 67.8% of those deaths involved an opioid. Through a combination of efforts, the good news here is that I believe we are starting to make progress with controlled prescription opioid op overdoses. Whether it is the increased use of naloxone, the increased use of medication-assisted treatment drugs, a decline in prescribing rates, or a combination of them all, we are now seeing a 13% decline when comparing the preceding 12 months ending in February. We are also making progress on overdoses involving methadone. Unfortunately, we continue to see increases of overdose deaths from fentanyl, and let me be clear, it's the illicit fentanyl and the analogs. Since 1997, DEA has been collecting the results of drug chemistry analysis from local, state, and federal level forensic laboratories in a system called NFLIS. We are collecting information from 283 laboratories across the country, representing an estimated 98% of the nation's 1.5 million annual drug cases. This is a great tool by which we can monitor trends in trafficking, abuse, and misuse of controlled substances. One trend that we are monitoring involves encounters of buprenorphine in law enforcement cases. We recognize that since the substance is being prescribed with greater frequency, encounters will increase. But what we have for the first time seen is encounters of buprenorphine eclipsing those of hydrocodone, making it the third most frequently encountered controlled prescription opioid in the United States. I would like to hear from you all today on why we are seeing a disproportionate number of encounters when we normalize encounters against the number of prescriptions written for buprenorphine versus hydrocodone and oxycodone. Now I want to transition into a discussion of our regulatory priorities. I can't see my time, uh-oh. Let me speed up. For context, this slide contains DEA's regulatory priorities which it submits two times per year to the White House's Office of Management and Budget. Those above the bright red line are active, while those below the red line are considered to be long-term. 
Passage of the Support Act last year put several new regulatory requirements on the unified agenda, and we have been working against statutory deadlines to implement those. There are a total of four of them. As you can see, the mobile NTP rule remains on the unified agenda. I am happy to report that it has left the Department of Justice and is now under a 90-day review with OMB. So I truly, truly believe we will be able to get that proposal out to you by year's end. I hope that's good news for most of you. I talked to Mark about it, and he was very excited about it. We have a forthcoming rule which will outline the circumstances under which DEA will issue a special registration for the practice of telemedicine. Of course, I'm limited in what I can say here but we are see and what we are seeking to do, but let me assure you all that Congress has expressed its strong desire that this rule assists those suffering from addiction in rural areas. DEA is also now seeking to amend the fees it collects from registrants. I'm sorry, but we have to do it. In the height of the opioid epidemic, DEA has been expending more than it is taking in. It's been seven years since the last increase, and this has become a priority for the DEA and the Department of Justice. Finally, we are seeking to change our regulations dictating the manner in which emergency doctors can either dispense or administer MAT drugs, commonly referred to as the three-day rule. This did not make the unified agenda, but we recognize that it is also vitally important. On Saturday, October 26, DEA and our partners around the country will host the 17th National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. It's an event that we hold twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall, to help reduce the amount of excess opioids available for diversion and abuse. Every year since the program started in 2010, we've signed up more partners, collected more prescription drugs, and as a result, saved more lives. In the last nine years, DEA has collected 6,000 tons of unused, expired, and potentially dangerous medications through this program, and a third of that since 2017. Each tablet, patch, and pill collected represents a potential life saved. You can help us get the word out. We have a partnership tool at www.deatakeback.com. There you can download digital media to display in your offices, including pamphlets, posters, social media templates, and press release templates. This is the conclusion of my presentation, but I just want to say one more thing to you all. I support you all. The 9,000 men and women of DEA support you. And we need you as our partners to continue to fight and combat the opioid epidemic that has affected our country. Thank you. Thank you, Donetta, and to be clear, since our founding in 1984, we have always found the DEA to be a partner. We have not been critical of regulatory oversight. We might from time to time make a point or two about the coordination at the field level, but they always get resolved because you've got some great people at the DC office, and they have always been partners going back to the time of Gene Hazlett and, and all of his uh, subsequent leaders since that time. The only thing I'd ask you is that as the DEA talks about expanding treatment, you also talk about the expansion of the OTP system. So that's a system that you know all too well, but I think sometimes 
as we talk about policy in this area. Curiously, the expansion of the OTP system seems to be in a sort of different corridor. So I'm encouraging you as you go around the country and as your colleagues go around the country, and I say this to SAMHSA as well, you have a real network. And it is increasing, if you noticed. We're now past 1,700, but we should be way higher than that. So it's something that you want to, because we're pushing out into rural and suburban communities. So now, uh, I'd like to introduce a real friend to our field, uh, and I will tell you something about him before he comes up. He did get our Friend of the Field Award in 2000, 19 years ago, and I'll tell you why. So General McCaffrey is the president of his own consulting firm. He also serves as a national security and ter terrorism analyst for NBC. General McCaffrey served in the United States Army for 32 years and retired as a four-star general. At retirement, he was the most highly decorated serving general having been awarded three Purple Heart Medals, two Distinguished Service Crosses, and two Silver Stars for Valor. For five years after leaving the military, General McCaffrey served as the Director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. And upon leaving government service, he served at West Point as the Bradley Distinguished Professor of International Security Studies from 2001 to 2005 and an adjunct professor of international security studies from 2006 to 2010. He previously served as the associate professor in the Department of Social Sciences from 73 to 76, teaching American government and comparative policies. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He is the chairman of the Addiction Policy Forum Advisory Board. He has served on the board of directors of several corporations in engineering, design, technology, healthcare, and services sector. He attended Phillips Academy in Andover, graduated from West Point with a Bachelor of Science degree, and earned a master's in American government from American University, and attended the Harvard University National Security Program, as well as the Business School Executive Education Program. In 2015, he was elected for the Doughboy Award, which is the highest honor the Chief of Infantry can bestow on any infantryman for outstanding contributions to the United States Infantry. May 2010, he was honored as a distinguished graduate by the West Point Association of Graduates at the United States Military Academy. He's married to Jill Ann McCaffrey. They have three married children, adult children, and six grandchildren. Their son, Colonel Sean McCaffrey, retired from the armed forces after a career in an infantry officer. And their daughter, Tara Larson, is an ICU nurse the daughter, Amy McKinney, is a teacher. That tells you about his career. Now, I'm going to tell you just a bit about the man before he comes up. The reason we gave this gentleman the Friend of the Field Award is because while he was President Clinton's drug czar, we had a certain big city mayor, big city, up in the north, though, who wanted to close all the methadone treatment programs at the time. It's 1998. He's sort of like prone to making off-the-cuff comments. You'll eventually figure out who I'm talking about. <laughs> and one morning, he apparently got up, and he said, we're going to close all these methadone programs because we don't really need them, and why should treatment exist for more than two years? Well, we were starting to get clobbered, and I mean fast and hard. And I was getting calls from the Times and all Washington Post, and then it started to be getting into the area of media coverage and television. It was getting fierce, and the argument was moving in his direction, because he can be pervasive in the short run. It's the long run where you get into problems, of course. But ultimately, I, ha I was talking to all the federal agencies which have jurisdiction in this area, and finally, I get to General McCaffrey, and he just gets on the phone and said, expecting your call, what can I do to help? pretty close to the words he used at that time. I explained to him, and then he said, let's get the bright boys and girls around here. We're going to get you a press statement, which he did. And then the mayor, of course, did what he typically does. He fights back, but I sort of knew who was going to win the fight. And based on what I just described about General McCaffrey, no one in this room should be surprised either. I tried to explain that to the deputy mayor at the time, but <laughs> I think the poor thing was just sort of confused. 
So ultimately, uh, we did prevail, but the individual who made that turn was the gentleman you're gonna hear from in a couple of minutes. It was so profound a change that ultimately, the mayor relented and intimately and ultimately improved treatment in the New York City-based hospital system by five million dollars at the time, which was not widely reported. So with that, this is a man who has been active in our field even after he leaves the Office of National Drug Control Policy. This is a great guy. I mean, aside from everything, you know, aside from his professionalism, this is a terrific human being. It's my pleasure to welcome General Barry McCaffrey. Mark, thanks for a very generous introduction. And I, I've never forgotten that. It was 1998. Uh, you actually had me up, I think, to open that conference, which was in New York City, of all places. Uh, the mayor, a great American mayor, uh, had gotten up with a bad head that day and announced, I think there were 70,000 opioid addicts in New York City at the time. And he announced we were going to end the program. I, ultimately, I could have kissed him. It showcased everything that could be done to get people stabilized in treatment and save their lives. And he did back off. Uh, so it was a tremendous opportunity. But look, let me also just say in response to Mark, uh, he got 40 years of supporting this field and of energetically trying to connect and bring together sensible policy uh, in the area of chronic addiction, primarily the opioids. Uh, how about a round of applause to support and recognize his leadership? And thanks to Dave uh, Nisi and uh, Gloria Hanania and the ATOD Board of Directors and all of you, more importantly, in the room who devoted a good bit of your professional life to dealing with this issue. Special recognition to Donetta Spears and the DEA. Uh, I have worked with, thank God for the DEA. A, it's a tiny federal law enforcement agency, 9,000 some odd people. They are all over the face of the earth. Uh, they're in Colombia and Mexico and in Afghanistan carrying M4 carbines and trying to teach and, and deal with the upstream uh, consequences of, of these countries that produce masses, not of opioid diversion, but masses of heroin and, and other drugs and it's dangerous work. My son was an infantry captain serving in combat who wanted to go join the DEA, and my wife said, no, not on a bet, it's too dangerous. And I'm here to tell you, the, the, uh, right now in the 200 largest cities in America, the principal element of organized crime are Mexican drug cartels. It used to be the Russians, Nigerians, Dominicans, they've all been run out of business, it's the cartels. They are organized, they have submarines and aircraft and electronic warfare, and they buy uh, corruption, not just a judge or a cop, but they buy voting behaviors in national legislatures. And they get in and hire international PR firms and law firms. So the DEA stands up to them, and thank God for that, and we welcome their uh, courage and their integrity. And by the way, they're almost uncorruptible. I never talk about this issue. You know, I was in, in uh, 1996, I was a serving four-star general, I'm an army brat, my wife's an army brat. Uh, President Clinton had a problem, uh, the drug policy director quit, I don't blame him. Distinguished man, PhD, several books, police chief of New York City. He was treated so abysmally by both the Congress and the administration, he just walked off the job. They were in trouble. They searched around for uh, some chump to take the job and came up with me. And I went in on interviews with the vice president. The president I told him I didn't want to do it. I gave him a, a written strategy paper on how to deal with the issue because I had seen the U.S. Armed Forces come apart drugs and alcohol starting in the Vietnam War and the tail end of it. It was a nightmare. It was incredible. Uh, we had rates of abuse of probably a third of our troops at the worst of it, primarily the Army, Marines, later on delayed five years later the Navy. Air Force sort of skipped a lot of it. It was another nightmare. So I told him, 
I don't want the job, here's how to deal with them. I gave them the names of three people who I thought were qualified. I talked to my dad, a retired soldier with 38 years in, in the armed force, and he said, shut up and do what you, the president asked you to do. So for five and a half years, I was delighted to do it. And then I spent the last 15 years staying engaged in all aspects of drug-related policy. A, a, sort of a brief shout out. I've been a student, been mentored by some incredible people over the years, and they continue. Dr. Bob DuPont, we just wrote an op-ed together. Uh, Dr. Nora Volkow, the knighted director, this genius uh, scientist, neuro neuroscientist, Dr. Alan Leshner, her predecessor, still engaged, Dr. Bertha Madras up at Harvard, quantifiable data, outcome data, uh, Jess Nickel, APF, that uh, Addiction Policy Forum that Mark uh, mentioned, brilliant young woman, the daughter of two heroin addicts, both of whom died of the disease. Her sister died of the disease. Uh, she used to coach me, this is a three-generational problem when you have a chronic opioid addict. Betsy Petullo, trying to understand health insurance. Our behavioral health care insurance is broken. It doesn't make any sense. It's too complicated. It's not aligned with the goals of medical, sensible medical treatment. I was just at the uh, inauguration uh, meeting of a new group on, on uh, criminal justice reform. We're going to try and make a difference in the coming years. Dr. Jeremy Travis and Lori Robinson were there, uh, compatriots of mine out of the Department of Justice, who understand how you have to uh, wrap in uh, the legal system to, to address this problem. So a lot of you remember the name Dr. Herb Kleber, the late Dr. Herb Kleber, wonderful, kind, brilliant man. I used to, when I would testify to Congress, I'd be calling him in the half hour before I testified with questions. Uh, I think we have here Dr. Mary Jean Creek, a brilliant scientist. Mary Jean, are you here? Might have gotten on an early plane, been a tremendous help. The FDA, the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, SAMHSA, uh, Carson Fox, National Association of Drug Courts. Every month, there's a new major TV story in every community where they've just discovered a brand new concept, a drug court, and they want to bring it to our attention. When I started working the issue in 1996, there were a dozen drug courts, and the Attorney General Janet Reno told me, go to Miami and become a student of that wonderful judge, which I did for four days. We now have over 4,000 drug courts. Now, we've got some continuing challenges. We've got to get them on the same template. We've got to make sure they're, uh, follow, they understand and comply with regulations. But it's a dramatic uh, change, and NADCP has been a big part of it. Jason Herzog, AverHealth. I just uh, got associated with them. They're collecting data now on a half million people in, uh, in treatment. We're going to try and understand with data outcomes. A lot of people uh, I continue to be in touch with who have made a big difference in my own education. And by the way, it's essentially science, prevention, treatment, international cooperation, and law enforcement. It's not any one of them. You certainly can't start only focused on treatment. Now, what's the most important thing I've learned out of now 20 plus years dealing with this? If you have to identify one element of the strategy, one thing that you're going to focus on, what would it be? Prevention and education. You have to have a message that's based on science. It can't be flim-flam. It has to be appropriate for the population you're talking to. It has to be appropriate to adolescents. It has to start early. If you were adequately resourced, I suppose it would include a mental health educational element early on in adolescence also. But as a general statement, you know, we tell people, if you can get your eighth grader through the 12th grade and they're mostly drug-free or minimal exposure to drugs, and by that I mean pot, alcohol, and ecstasy, although in some communities we find more eighth graders using heroin than 12th graders, but if you can get children through that experience through a variety of tools, they're going to be drug-free for the rest of their life. 
You just don't finish the last year of law school and start using cocaine. That's not the way it works. So it's a prevention education focus. I know you know that, but we got to underscore it. And the treatment community can be a big help in educating uh, the public about the consequences of addiction. Treatment, the hardest nut, for God's sakes, it's just unbelievable. And by the way, somebody already made the point, you can't focus on one drug. The most dangerous drug, bar none in America, is what? Tobacco. It kills over 400,000 people a year. It's devastating in its impact. And now we think vaping with THC and or nicotine uh, may turn out to be another terrific uh, challenge to health care. So tobacco, alcohol, 2017 data, uh, over 400,000 tobacco, 88,000 dead from alcohol. If you talk to a serious street cop 10 years on the force, they say, my biggest problem, bar none, is alcohol. Most people arrested for burglary were under the influence of alcohol when they committed the crime. They weren't breaking into the house to get money for alcohol. It contributed to devastation in their personal life. And that's why they're existing in a life of crime. And then finally, overdose, 2017 stats, 72,000 dead. Can you imagine what we would say? That's a higher loss rate than the US Armed Forces in World War II. Unbelievable. Primarily, it was opioids of one sort or another. Primarily, as you all know, it was a kicker of fentanyl coming through the US Postal Service from China, although now it's going to get manufactured in Mexico and other places. So treatment's the hardest nut to, to crack, uh, bar none. But you've got to start off saying it's poly drug abuse, and that includes alcohol. OK, anything work in this field? Do we have any tools that we are have confidence in, there is some isolated magic. Number one, AANNA. Dr. Bob DuPont, I took the job as drug policy director, he said, you gotta go sit in on a dozen open meetings of AA or you'll never understand this issue. Millions of us as Americans are walking by each other, having gained sobriety because of AANNA. It's got to be updated. I'm not sure the concept uh, is yet where we need to, to get it, but it's an astonishing contribution uh, to the field. Drug courts, we talked about. You put somebody in a drug court, maybe 8,000 bucks a year later, the chances are over 80%, they'll be currently drug free. Now the question's got to be, how do we keep them drug free? I always use five years as my template. You got to be drug free for five years, and then we'll see what, where we go from there. Um, Evidence-based practice, we know we've got to have science in this, along with the art form. And finally, and I think importantly, pharmaceutical intervention combined with behavioral health care. You know, one of the big uh, treatment facilities I went to early on as a drug policy director, a wonderful group of people, they're all over the country, and I asked them if they were using methadone, having been educated by Mark and his people in New York City uh, at some of the OTPs. And the director said proudly, no, we're a drug-free institution. I might add, he also said, when I said, is there a spiritual component to this uh, program? And he said, yes, but with a small s. And I've always wanted to write an article that talks about the large s of a spiritual component of people in recovery. Uh, it doesn't have to be a classic Christian, Christian thing, but it's there. Uh, so, We've got a problem, you know, I, I, I tell people I was wounded three times in combat. You come into a, a clearing station, a Marine Corps medical station, and they, they look at the patient and they'll say, oh, I see, we got somebody with a gunshot wound, malnutrition, malaria, some evidence of PTSD, and they come up with a treatment program, and they use all the tools that are available that have scientific validity. That includes methadone, buprenorphine, extended release injectable naltrexone and naloxone. Careful on naloxone. You know, it's cheap. We give the librarian naloxone in a 15 minute class, give the sheriff's deputies. I was down here, I think it was Orlando, a couple of years ago, talking to the sheriff's annual meeting, awards meeting. He told me they had just gone out, uh, they had brought some young guy back three times, overdose from uh, fentanyl and, and uh, heroin. And they went out, the mother calls hysterically, they go out to the house, he's dead. They put him in the 
ambulance and evacuate him. 15 minutes later, the mother calls again. The younger boy is dead in the basement. So we simply can't focus on the last point of crisis and think we're making any impact except saving your daughter, your son, your mother. Uh, we gotta, we gotta do better than that. Another issue I know you're all aware of, you know, the most important uh, thing I was um, capable of doing in government was I had a $19 billion budget. So people were always, there were 70 some odd organizations fighting for dollars uh, in my office. And the enemy was mental health care, who were trying to get our drug addiction dollars away from us. But as you know, you simply cannot deal with this issue unless you understand there's a mental health care and a drug addiction uh, uh, capability that you, you gotta face up to. You gotta do it with science-based standards. So you gotta address SUD and mental health care at the same time. A big one that I'm proud that Mark had uh, highlighted during this conference. I've been in half the jails and prisons in America, and they are, by and large, a mess. They're underfunded, more so the jails and communities. Uh, to some extent, some of the state courts, the federal system tends to be much better run, uh, but it's a, it's a huge challenge. And, um, you know, you get into a chronic, uh, criminal justice incarcerated situation and the despair is just unbelievable. Nobody wants to talk until recently about uh, treatment of, of addiction disorders behind bars. They didn't even want AA and NA there, never mind starting methadone treatment program, behavioral health care. We gotta face up to that. Some of the bright people in corrections are starting to understand that. If you don't, you know, a couple million people behind bars, half a million go out the door every year. They're back chronically addicted within 72 hours. We know that. We have gotta bring um, the substance use disorder treatment inside the bars. We gotta have re-entry courts, just like drug courts in the front end. And we have to turn them over to OTP or other providers and when they walk out the door, or we'll never get there. If you're hunting zebras, you go to the water hole. The people behind bars, my data says, 85% of them have some kind of a substance abuse disorder. You gotta deal with it, or, or you'll never break out of this. The people that know that are the cops. You talk to a patrol officer, a sheriff's deputy, they understand that. They know the names of every chronic addict here in uh, Orlando. They see them all the time, emergency rooms, uh, social welfare agencies, and the jail. Um, and I guess, and then finally, and this is a tough one to, I was at a clinical uh, experts conference every year for several years, um, mostly treatment providers. Uh, we, ha we have a brilliant uh, physician PhD from a major medical school, and he announces to the group of us uh, that he has now done a meta-analysis, I like that word, of dozens of studies and he can conclusively tell all of us that acupuncture doesn't work. And the reason, he said that's assuming you even had a common definition of training and verification of acupuncture providers. What's the standard? So he said, it doesn't work. And the room turned into an uproar because we knew that longevity of staying in, the, in a treatment program definitely applies to the success of achieving sobriety. And so we have a variety of tools we're using in treatment that aromatherapy, equine therapy, massage therapy, uh, that may not have much scientific validity to them, but if they keep our population in treatment, that over time we get better results. The bottom line is there is still an art form a spiritual element, uh, as well as a medical and pharmaceutical element to successful, successfully decent, uh, dealing with the chronic addicts. So here we are, you know, who knows the numbers? I say there's 20 million of us who are dealing with a serious uh, chronic addiction of one sort or another. Number varies by how you define it. Uh, mostly it tends to be poly drug abuse. Uh, alcohol always leads a pack. 
Uh, by the way, and I mentioned cigarettes, because if you're concerned about lethality as a healthcare provider, and yet you go into a treatment program, what's the chances of you learning that it's a smoke-free environment? Because we found out our patients won't stay if, they, if you don't let them smoke. So it's a challenge. Uh, a lot of it's alcohol, uh, we think 74%. Uh, but it's, it's probably, without question, the single biggest health care, law enforcement, family-related and work-related issue in America. That's the deal. And we've got to remind ourselves, most of us don't have a substance abuse disorder. But the population that does is painful to deal with. We've got to face up to it. And let me just tell you, all of you in this room, thank God for your work. If you can make a difference in one life, in the job you're now doing, it'll repay your existence on Earth. Get on out there and do continue doing the right thing. Thanks for including me in your, your program. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, General McCaffrey. And now you see why we gave this gentleman our Friend of the Field Award. And he's a busy guy. He flew in from Seattle last night. He's flying out later on. And I, I'm grateful for you to include us in your travels. And I know it's the commitment you have to this issue. And certainly, I'm grateful for the commitment you have to our association and its members. So now I'm going to uh, ask Danita Smith to join us on the podium. This is the portion right before our raffle as we wrap up. This is when we pass the baton. So this is when Dave Nisi, after his 18 years of preparation, concludes. Your family gets you back. Certainly Amy gets you back. And you won't be going home at various late hours of the night, which, as Victoria will attest, happens with me too. And now we pass this off to Danita Smith, who represents the Nevada Providers to our board of directors and will serve as the chair of the April 2021 conference in Las Vegas. And now I will turn this over and the baton over to Danita. Welcome. I'm just preparing for 2021. Okay. But as um, Mark said, and Dave, I want to thank everyone. This has been a great conference, but on behalf of our state representatives in Nevada, the Nevada Opioid Treatment Association, our SOTA, Dr. Stephanie Woodard, and Dr. Miriam Adelson, we're saying we're very excited to host the next conference, okay? Now, yes, this has been a wonderful conference. You know, and Dave indicated that there were 1,700 in attendance. I am convinced, no, I'm confident that in Nevada we're gonna do much better. We look forward to seeing all of you. I've been introducing myself as your next conference chair. It is official now. Thank you, guys. That was a okay. <laughs> See, I always sort of love that when uh, the new conference chair comes and speaks with such enthusiasm, warms my heart. <laughs> and then about two months from now, there's inevitably a call of, you know, sort of like what we call the delayed response, where someone says, in this case, Danita, so what did I get myself into? But at that point, see, after this introduction, she's already engaged, so it, there's no way to back off. But the wonderful thing about this, and Dave did this when we had our conference in New York, and Allegra Shore, the, the conference chair in New York in March of 2018, was a great bridge to Dave. Dave will be a great bridge to Danita. We have various conference chairs in the room. They form a camaraderie to help make sure that there's continuity. I believe in long-term strategic planning. I think it's effective if you're smart about it, and we certainly try to be. So now to our raffle, and uh, we will, I am not in the raffle per se, except for the last item. Another thing I'm confident of, whoever name I choose, I'm confident they're going to be there. Ah, uh, yes, but if you're not here, you can't collect this particular prize, so then another drawing happens. Let's see. Okay. 
Okay. Deirdre Godbolt. Yay! Okay, this is a $200 Amazon gift. You see, it's how she sped up. $200 Amazon gift card. Okay. No. Oh, yeah, we're doing this for a while. We got four times the chance. Oh, okay. <laughs> See that teamwork there. Shauna Bacon. Shauna Bacon. Yay, two for two. Let's see if this speeds her up. This is an Apple iWatch. <laughs> yes. You know, I don't think it's fair that the people up here can't win these. What do you think? I know. These are all easy names. I love it. Deborah Berryman. Yes? Ooh, they're getting better. This is a $500 American Express gift card. Thank you. Enjoy. 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 Okay, this is the grand prize. Maybe it'll be a male. Okay, can we get a drum roll? Angel Duncan. Yay, four for four. I know one person will be going to the 2021 conference paid in full. I'm confident. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then the one last piece, and this person does not have to be here, if, if they are here better, Eddie and Norge, the winner of the $125 Amazon gift card. This was the social media tag and hashtag raffle. Well, in this case, we will then send it to you. And ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attendance. I thank you for coming. Thank you to Dave. Janetta, Joan McCaffrey. As, as Danita said, because she's got such a high level of confidence and because the Venetian Hotel will be such an excellent host hotel, pulling out all the strings for us. For now, we close this conference, safe travels home, and as General McCaffrey said, I totally agree. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for being on the front line. Be healthy, be well, travel safely. Thank you. And the clinic tours also begin now, so for those of you who signed up, please make your way.